1978 was the year. That's Rat Trap from the Boomtown Rats. And with Bob Geldof here in the studio with me, there's an opportunity here with you, Bob, to mm. just really look at that song for a second. Mm. Because to me, it sums up the way life was in 78, yeah. every bit as much as the way that my generation summed up how life was in 65 when Pete Townsend wrote that for The Who. So the construction of that song and the context then, the environment of that song as you began to work on it. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that and how you rolled that song out. I was working in a, a slaughterhouse in an abattoir in Dublin and I gave myself six months. I'd come off the roads. I was driving heavy machinery, building the M23, M25, Merstham Interchange. So if you come out of Gatwick and you're getting on the 25, <laughs> that's Geldof Corner. That's why there's a permanent jam there. <laughs> I wasn't great at these machines, but um, the season was over. And by that, I mean the summer season. And usually these big machines, they stop because the rain just stops play. You can't plough up the ground with these things. They just stop. And I'd heard that there was great opportunities up at the Yukon in the Arctic Circle for driving the machines I could drive, digging gold. But you needed to have a girl with you because guys would just work in these appalling conditions get out of their machines, get drunk and fight and be incapable the next day. So you had to have a girl. I'd just been dumped. <laughs> so the plan was, because I didn't know any other women, um, how do I re-woo this, this woman and invite her to the Arctic Circle? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I had to go back to Dublin to get her. And uh, I always needed a job. I was always panicky about having nothing on. And... Uh, I got a job in the abattoir in Bulls Bridge, and uh, I began to re-woo Daphne, uh, you know, with offal, obviously, which always does for the girl. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think, I think the livers, the kidneys, these offerings that I brought to her door on a nightly basis. Finally, I think the, the tripe did for her, you know, <laughs> and, and she agreed to come to the Arctic Circle with me. But as I was sort of saving up, I'd always save my money from the roads and these months in the abattoir. And I'd go in very early in the morning and I was surrounded by these kids, I suppose, one of whom was called Paul. A very working class Dublin, very hardcore, mid-70s, no opportunity whatsoever. And uh, I was on the killing floor and, um, you know, I was sort of in a howling wolf fantasy you know down on the killing floor you know and stuff like that and i didn't mind it i had just six months were in my head but i was looking at these people and for some reason this little thug befriended me and he'd come in on a monday and uh he'd say joe and i say weekend there robert you know and i say yeah not bad thanks paul and i'd say how is yours and he tapped discreetly his white slaughterman's coat at his wrist at his uh, waist and he'd go three stitcher and he'd open his coat and there was an axe in his waistband. And the three-stitcher was that he'd have manufactured a fight in the pub and just pulled his axe and just, bam, smacked a guy and three stitches. And uh, yeah, very nice, good. <laughs> <laughs> nice, polite South Dublin middle-class lad, you know. And uh, so it, I got friendly with him. I didn't have a choice, you know. I didn't want six <laughs> stitches in my head. So uh, I was watching these people and he had a girlfriend called Judy. And I was thinking of Ray Davies' Waterloo Sunset, I think. And I started writing the story of Paul and Judy, except Billy just scanned. Mm. And they came from the Five Lamps area of Dublin, which was hardcore. It was no go for the police even. And um, so I wrote about those people that I was working with. And I, you know, I... I wasn't writing songs. I know I, I didn't know I could write songs. I just wrote lots of words. And come time, the second album, of Tonic for the Troops, we came to the end of it, and the producer, Mutt Lang, has said, we're missing a track. We're missing the track. And I, we were getting killed by the music press because we were having single after single after single, and they were saying, oh, they're just a singles band, as if that was a bad thing, you know. Mm. Hold on, I remember another singles band called The Beatles, you know. But, yeah, quite. I mean, you know, but, uh, I mean singles we weren't, artists like yeah, Elvis Presley. Yeah, I mean. yeah. I, we weren't The Beatles, but, I mean, nonetheless, it was annoying me. And I said, I've got these words and I've got these, these chords, ding, 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 G, D, E minor. And I played around. He goes, well, take me through it. And it was, and he said, no, let's work on that. So 
I sat in a room with mud. And really, the truth is that he built it out of those very lame, just around and around in a circle chords. All that arrangement is really his. The da-da-da, that's the, the, the brass on it, but they were the chords I was playing anyway. And um, that was it. And uh, he said, that's, yeah, that's great. That makes it an album now, an album track. Kenny Everett wanted us to do his show. And we said, OK. And we said, well, we don't want to do another single because we get killed. And I can't remember the producer, well, what do you want to do? He said, let's do the most album track we got, Rat Trap. And he said, OK. So we did Rat Trap, and if you remember that show and people uh, listening, they'll remember that there was high production quality. They actually made videos of each of the bands. Mm. And we were on tour. And we put this track out hoping that people would see that this was there was musicality in the band beyond just having the chorus. And we were in Newcastle and Nigel Grange of the record company rang up and exactly like you would dream of if you're in a band or you read about in books, the Kenny Everett show went out. The next morning people were going into uh, record stores and saying, have you got that new record by the Boomtown Rats? And Nigel rang up and said, he said, we have to release this as a single. It was supposed to be the album track. <laughs> this was the one that got us cred, you know. We said, right, right release it instantly. And um, to put it in context, one, two and three were Olivia Newton-John and John Travolta. Yeah. And I just thought it'll do okay, but we'd just come off at number six with like clockwork and I thought it'll do okay. Next minute it goes straight in at number nine, you know, hello. Then I went to number three. So I, I still have the music week, which was the music uh, paper for the industry. I clipped the charts, which had us at number three, got it framed. We'll never get higher than that. Yes. Bloody hell, the next week, number two. I mean, it really doesn't go like that. <laughs> and I thought, and so we were pushing John and Olivia out of the way. And next minute, number one. Mm. To get to number one, to get there. So this is the music industry in context for today. To get to number one, we had to sell 620,000 singles to get there. And and you're the one that I want was such a massive seller. I mean, you would have needed mm. to sell that kind of numbers. But I mean, the way that compares with the way things are now. Mm. And also, you know, as you're describing there, but watching, tracking this single gradually climb the charts, because yeah. I used to do that with the old rock and roll yeah, stuff, yeah. the other stuff, uh, or an Everly Brothers single, going in at 18, going up to 12, 9, will it make the top 5, yep. 6, 4, 2, and then, you know. So it, it, it took a couple of months in those days for a record to climb to number 1. Didn't it, it? This was quick, though. It took us the, I think, the, the four weeks from the Kenny Everett show. And the, again, that was the power of sort of a mono media yeah. everyone saw one show but i was glad it was that track because it was about the dublin that i was living in and about real people and to be more blunt it was to do with kind of what the rats i thought were because we were specifically irish which they never really got over here mm. they thought we were sort of coattailing maybe on the other bands that the words we were singing were you know derivative of those not at all i mean like they were all about what was going on in 1975 when we started and uh van of course is the great irish mm -hmm. genius there's just no question of it far by, by a million miles he is uh, but van because he was an outsider you know, he's in this ghetto lager, in a South African sense, mentality of the Protestant Ulsterman and the apartheid, sort of like his dad was working the shipyards. No Catholics could get jobs in the shipyards, but his dad had great musical taste. He listened to the blues and jazz. Van picked up on this. But Van had that great uh, creative int intellect where he understood there was a wider culture outside of this lager that he was in and tuned into that and picked up on the sort of mysticism of it and um, the Yatesian, you know, sort of literacy of it and combined those two instinctively and in a moment of genius. That's Van. Yes. So he was involved in a sort of uh, mystic idea of the place. Thin Lizzy and Philip, Philip used to follow the rats and got us over here and got us into the record companies, Phil Linnett, great writer. Philip was an outsider. He was the only black guy probably in Dublin and felt it, even though, frankly, he was about as black as me. In fact, in pictures of us laughing together, we look exactly the same. You know? <laughs> so uh, he was outside and felt it. And so he wanted to belong desperately. So look at Thin Lizzy's albums, they're all Celtic imagery. All his songs are about 
Celtic heroes, uh, you know, Roisin Dove, who was the avatar for Ireland itself, Kathleen Nihulahan, that was an avatar for Ireland because the Irish weren't actually allowed to say the name Era under occupation. And so he took all this mythology and said, I'm into this. So you had the mysticism of Van, the yeah. mythology of Philip, and then you had the rooted blues of Rory Gallagher. He did come from the Deep South, except it was Cork. He did come from the Delta, except it was the River Lee. But, <laughs> you know, Rory thought he was in the Mississippi Delta. So you had that fantasy. So you had myth, mysticism and fantasy. I wanted absolute urban reality. This is where we're at. This is the life we're living. So you get Looking After Number One, you get Banana Republic, mm -hmm. you get all those songs that are, are about that. And revisiting this material now, Bob, for the, the collection. Yeah. How has that felt? Because um, there had been a gap, hadn't there, between engaging with the Boomtown Rats, letting it go for a little while, and now coming back to it. Well, so 27 years. Yeah, exactly. So this massive gap that opened, you know, I mean, coming back to this material now. Because yeah. I can't imagine that you, I mean, you don't live in the past at all. No. And I can't imagine that you would have been playing any of these songs on rotation up until again just recently i did a couple in with uh, the solo band the bobcats and um you know i'd do them if i felt like them and they were just as genuine when i did them because as you say i don't I'm, ain't no rear view mirror in this car you know but you have other things to say that are not pertinent to the band the band is the band the rats were the rats they were like six of us you know and coming from a shared experience and then you have the unique experience of your own life and as you get older what, what i think happens really and this is how i think it gets a bit boring is that a kid whoever you are leaves the familiar terrain and the safe terrain of the known parameters of the school life and the family even if you're bucking the trend even if you're kicking against it, even if you're being a rebel the teachers know who you are, your mates know who you are, you go home, your family knows who you are, it's relatively safe. And then you leave, and the big world is there, and you go, da da and here I am world, and the world goes, not interested. Mm. And it's a cold world. And the singular mind looks at this, I think, and demands attention. And if that attention isn't there, seeks to create an own universe within which one can function and is comfortable. And that would be the classic entrepreneurial type, whether it's Winston Churchill doing crap at school, Richard Branson doing crap at school, or indeed many of the pop people you meet. John Lennon. John Lennon, or any of them, Johnny mm. Rotten, you mm. know. You'd, and they look v with these cold eyes and this absolute clarity at this world, and they reject it because it's rejected them. And so you get very interesting ideas coming out with your... I mean, really, pop is a young man's art. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get the singular mind, the singular way of... Same chords, same instrumentation, Kurt Cobain, you hear it and you just go, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Just like, what's that? That's it. And um, I don't know if that will continue. I doubt it. I don't know if it has the same relevance um, to the culture. But as you get older... You have made that world that you railed against. You've made your own universe now. So there's no point railing against it anymore. It's your world. Yes. So now you, <laughs> now you turn inwards and you say, what's it done to you? And you yeah. start examining the entrails, literally. And so the function of songwriting changes and becomes more internal. And I think that's how people get the great ones, like Loudon Wainwright III, who really can nail age, I think, and the experience of that, uh, almost on a specific microscopic level. He's so interesting, so great a writer. Van occasionally gets it, he can nail it. Neil Young occasionally really gets it. Dylan can't get it at all, I don't think. The odd expression comes up, but not that. So any of those people, I don't think, I've done it properly, really. Well, the thing is, also, in the very early days, there's a spontaneity, isn't it? You're not really thinking about things too much. You're just kind of doing it. But then as time goes by, Bob, did you, do you find or did you find yourself beginning to kind of second-guess your songwriting? That it didn't flow quite as easily, in a way? Yeah, but it that's not... I mean, you've got... You, you've come out, you've looked around, you've sort of put down... I mean, quite literally, I, I wrote Looking After Number One on a dole queue, and it was 9.15... And the Dole office was supposed to open at nine. And we were in the rain. I mean, never mind me, this young kid, but these older people. 
the disrespect, the disregard um, that was shown to them by these civil servants on their lifetime jobs inside there. And, you know, I did pull out the piece of paper and I've still got and it's rain splattered and it's the world owes me a living. Mm. I've waited on this docu too long. I mean, mm. it's just, you're just writing that moment. Mm. And so when it came to the rats again, the reason for doing it is really threefold, as I've said, age. I'm curious, was it that good? You know, is that just something? Enough time has passed to let... I mean, you've you've spoken to a million bands and there's people who've been in bands listening every single minute in each other's faces, side by side in a bus, side by side in a, in a plane, sleeping in the same hotel rooms, then sleeping in your own hotel, so if it gets better, yeah, and going back. It's really close you know, to proximity, this, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, and you all are supposed to have this shared... Aim. Well, mm. as time goes on, it's not possible. Mm. And so these things, these political infighting, you know, forget it. And then songwriting itself, as you just suggested, becomes less... Eff was it effortless? Yeah, it was fairly effortless at first. You know, it spills out. But, you know, the first Rats record is essentially Dr. Feelgood from kids a few years younger that's really it the second album is everything we learned from Mutt Langer, how to construct rock and roll and Elvis Costello mm -hmm. really I just looked at that and just thought that is so excellent could I even come near to that standard and so that's where Tonic for the Troops comes from those sort of things plus all the hinterland of music that I was obsessed by pre the feel goods yeah. all that but as I say age curiosity and cash made me go back, you know, <laughs> and uh, cash, always handy. And, um, you know, we were offered a lot to do this thing. Um, not a lot, relatively a lot, you know, the Isle of Wight and all these other ones. And I wasn't going to do it, going back to your earlier suggestion. I wasn't going to do it if it was nostalgia. I genuinely wasn't. I wasn't interested in that. So I said, I'll give it a go. We got together, and the first thing that sort of shocked me was the power of this band. And that's wild that these five random selected individuals. Two of them were in the pub the night I went early in a spring evening out of boredom. Didn't like pubs, but nothing else do. There they were. Let's start a band, okay? Completely randomly, they make this sound, and that's true of any band, that is absolutely unique. Put someone else in there, doesn't really work. You can watch Mick doing Satisfaction with his solo band. Great. Mick with his solo band doing Satisfaction. Keith the next night doing Give Me Shelter with his band. Amazing. Hear the Rolling Stones do it, and it's a whole other experience. So that's it. So I got together, and I forgot the power of these, this band. You know, that was the first thing. Oh, oh yeah. And the second thing was, I started singing these songs, and I had to re-hear, renew my acquaintance with uh, the words. And when I sang, the world owes me a living. I don't want to be like you. I'm going to be like me. When I sang that, it was with the exact same animus, the same conviction. And when I sang Rat Trap, the traps had been sprung long before he was born, Hope by Sadus behind all those closed doors. You know, when I sang that, when I sang Banana Republic specifically, which is kind of now, I suppose, the unofficial Irish national anthem, you know, which we got banned for in Ireland, that song. What's changed? When I sang, you know, I Don't Like Mondays, it was the week that that guy in Santa Santa Monica just killed his parents and I think five of his mates, you know, about six, eight weeks ago. What's changed? Tragically, what's changed? I could have written those things that way yesterday. That's terrible. Our generation has failed so utterly, so spectacularly. All those things we said, 1976, we just repeated it, and actually... As Mark said, this time is farce. This is the Bob Harris Show here on BBC Radio 2. We're talking with Bob Geldof, reminiscing about the songs, the success of the Boontown Rats, and uh, reflecting on the passing of time. I mean, it goes to your point about as time goes on, like clockwork, you know. I mean, again, the words are... That happened very quickly. Like, we got big very quickly. And... Um, you know, they're all oh, Mr. Rockstar. Like, if you remember the sort of cultural Taliban at that time, you know, you weren't. <laughs> and uh, and that's, that's like our first gigs in England when we arrived were with 
two other bands that had just arrived the same week as us. They were called the Ramones of the Talking Heads. Wonder what happened to them. <laughs> and um, we played in schools in the afternoon. We played at 4.30 in gymnasiums. And the kids were wearing Shawadi Wadi shirts and yeah, Bay City Rose turned up things. Like, you know. And uh, very quickly, that music that we were making and others became, as you know, the music of the moment. And uh, suddenly we were being told, oh, well, you know, you've sold out that. And so this song was, I'm not disconnected. I'm not unaware. And this is very influenced by the bands we've been playing with, the Talking Heads, you know. And if you listen to it, you hear that, that sort of um, metronomic beat. And, uh, you know, I'm in one place at one time. I'm neither here nor there. I'm hooked to the mainstream, tuned into the world, plugged into my surroundings. I'm not out on a limb. I'm thinking in a straight <laughs> line. I'm thinking that these thoughts are mine, you know. And it's just insisting on normality. But uh, a good song. Yeah, but, I mean, normality, you, you're now catapulted into hit records, you know, the, the whole sort yes, of thing, the energy. Reality. And, of course, nothing, there's nothing that really prepares you for that is there there isn't but i loved it look any anyone listening knows i mean you grew up with nothing with no money you've got money it's a lot better you know <laughs> um you grow up obviously everyone ignoring you and next minute you're famous and i loved it but i said to angie erigo the journalist from the enemy on the very first interview we did you know, you weren't supposed to say this, but then again, the new wave thing was a counterculture. It was a counter-orthodoxy. So, you know, I'm a contrarian, I suppose, to the nth, and if there's an orthodoxy, I'm against it. If there's a counter-orthodoxy, it's still an orthodoxy, so I'd be against that too. So I was saying things like, well, I'll take, you know, even looking after n number one, take the money, count your loss when I'm gone, I'm all right. Looking after number one. You know? <laughs> and they said, well, what do you want to get out of this? And she said, and I said, three things. She said, what did they say? I want to get rich. I want to get famous. And I want to get laid. I did. <laughs> yeah. And the fame thing I said, she said, it's an odd thing to want. And I said, no. And I said, I don't want to be anonymous. I said, I want to, I want to use the platform it gives me to talk about the things that bother me. Mm. That's what I said. So but I being think. so outspoken, I mean, people say, in retrospect, that that was one of the things that held things back for the rats in America. It was what held us back here, too. I mean, it was this jumped-up, self-opinionated Paddy Git. And um, it was um, countering what some of the cooler bands... I mean, the rats were really never cool. We were... I, I do remember that great enemy double page and it was a picture of Strummer looking fantastic on one page and a picture of me looking all right on the other and the headline was they got the guns but they got the numbers about the you know us and, and them and um, the implication being that they had this this focused aesthetic and and um, lyrical pointed idea and we just had thousands of people behind us buying the records and the argument well which in the end is more powerful it was a very good piece actually mm -hmm. but what came with that was that um we couldn't be cool we just weren't i talked too much as you've just heard i argued about every bloody thing if they said it was white i'd say well white ish you know and sort mm -hmm. of stuff and uh it just got to be a pain i got to be a complete pain but i sort of felt we had to talk our way into the charts because we were being largely ignored you see there were no punks from derbyshire you know so suddenly we're here the only non-london gang mm -hmm. and the only ones who befriended us really were the pistols because i suppose johnny was a paddy ultimately and uh paul stood in for johnny fingers once on top of the pops he we, we snuck a sex pistol onto top of the pops and phil linnett and myself and Stephen and paul from the pistols do you remember the greedy bastards yes i do because none of us saw any cash that's right and <laughs> philip like who had like you know big hits and that he was going oh jeez man like we got no readies let's let's start a band so he said well yeah okay but what do we do we go we go to the electric and we take all the cash from the door he said great so i remember being backstage and i did a couple of rats hits philip did a couple of Lizzie hits Stephen Paul did a couple of pistol hits and that was your lot and we divvied <laughs> up backstage we left the false back pockets bulging with several fivers you know <laughs> excellent but so I liked all that but the others we really didn't it wasn't fun that time 
we were all just going for it, all of us, you know. There wasn't time, you know, like, are we selling more than the jam, you know, have we sold out quicker than the clash, are the, are the tickets more expensive than them, you know, it was all that sort of stuff. The ones I had fun with were the Ramones. Yeah. They're, they're just great. So, so just one final thought then, because it, it builds and it builds. Okay, the, the popularity of the Rats is beginning to fall away. Yeah. But your personal profile just could not get higher. The mm. gap opens up between the two. The rats do then fall away, but you have become one of the most famous people on the planet mm. and must have been so swept away with that at the time with all the things that were coming at you and, and that you were instigating and everything that was going on around Live Aid and everything else. So after that, Bob, how did you, as it were, find yourself again, pull yourself back? And re well, I wasn't carried away. I wasn't carried away by it. In fact, I was very frightened by it, because it was with the rats and the stuff that went with it. I was like that. So you know, I was well known, but I wasn't pretending to be something I wasn't. When you go post live age, you move well outside of music circles. You move into sort of societal things. It's it's sort of, um, again, please no comparison, but I mean, once the Beatles had moved outside of being simply a music group into being a cultural phenomenon, then um, things completely change. And, you know, essentially they wanted to just make music. They had to retreat to make music. So um, with my thing, it was different. Um, they offered me the job of God, but I, you know, declined, thanks very much, you know. <laughs> and um, apparently that position was available at the time. And um, the St. Bob thing was this massive cult of personality, yeah. which I hated. And uh, it was very unsettling to have old ladies come up to you in the street and hesitantly touch you and burst into tears and hello did that happen yeah it did and um you know you you would have kids doing it at the height of your pop fame but that's sort of factored in into what that game is you know in fact i remember playing the liverpool empire with the rats and here we were on the stage where the beatles had one of their early great triumphs the coming home you mm. know and they were screaming at us so it was like I was in a hard day's night. But suddenly I thought, this is rubbish, you know, and I stopped the band. I said, what are you screaming at? Look, look at this face. Are you joking? Are you screaming at him? What? Stop it, you know. And I didn't like any of that. Post Live Aid, two things were, I hadn't expected it to be this phenomenon. And before it became phenomenal, I had said that I would guarantee that every single penny would get to someone who needed it. I said that on Simon Bates' show when I came to the breakfast show with the first mix of um, the Christmas song, Do They Know It's Christmas? Midge had stayed up all night and I brought it into Simon Bates and I'd said that. And uh, I meant that and so I still do it every day, and we've spent about £5,000 every single day for the last 30 years on the poorest people in Africa. So I was stuck, because I'd given my word to people who uh, had given their money, mm. which is a lot. Mm. And um, But I also realised that this... 1.45 billion audience, which in 85 was still a lot, but it was a huge amount then, and the cash that came in, which was huge, signif uh, signified something else, not just the cash, but it was a vast political lobby. You go with 1.5 billion votes, which every cent, pound, dollar meant, you can change things. So what was happening in Africa was, yes, hunger. People, so stop them immediately dying, that's first. Mm. But hunger is symptomatic of just one thing, uh, an empirical economic condition called poverty. And the only way you can end poverty is through economics and politics. So take the lobby that the concert had given us, the 1.5 million, and build up a political economic case for change, which was yeah. realised at Live Asia in 2005. It took 25 years, but it was realised then. That was the arc. But in the meantime, you had to overcome this nonsense about yourself. And I was broke now, because the band hadn't been really able to function, and had in effect broken up. We'd lost our record contract, our 
sales on the last album were non-existent. We couldn't really bring out the record because people would have said I was capitalising on Band Aid. Yes. <laughs> We'd sold out 42 gigs, so you know people say it was over. Not really. We could have gone through the slump like a lot of bands do, and if they if they have the discipline to stay together, they'll come out the other side and continue to round around. Or a case in point, obviously the Rolling Stones, obviously U2, obviously Thin Lizzy. If Philip hadn't believed that being a rock and roll star was not just a life choice, but actually a dedicated prophetic, you like know, Philip believed that you got up in the morning and put leather trousers on, like or else life wasn't really <laughs> worth living. You know, and there was a limousine lurking. <laughs> If he just waited, such a great band, they would have come out. Mm. Uh, so I, I wrote uh, that book to, one, dissuade people from any notions they may have about me, and two, to get a bit of cash. So that was where I found myself at that point, you know. And then gradually, when it took about two years, two and a half years, for the mania to die down and for us to put into place John Kennedy and all these other people, Midge and, uh, you know, uh, Michael Grade on the board of the Band-Aid Trust, to put in place the mechanism to get all this stuff moving. I mean, it was moving anyway, but to put in place solidity. And uh, so I stayed on top of that and then found that tunes were just kicking off in my head again. They were just going, you know, and I thought, oh, here we go again. And... Um, so I started making records again, and uh, to my dismay, six albums later, there are enough people on the planet who are vaguely interested so that the record company keeps saying, make another one. So, mm. not bad. I mean, it, it turned out fine. And then you get to go back and say, were those ones you did earlier with that bunch of guys, did they deserve to be hits? And the answer is yes. I was yeah. in Devon on Saturday playing to 8,000 people and the answer unequivocally is yes to see 14-year-olds jumping up and down singing She's So 1970s. <laughs> <laughs> She's So 20... You weren't born in the 20th century, you know. Um, yeah, they lasted and uh, they turned out to be very good rock and roll tunes. It turned out that the Boomtown Rats wasn't a mistake. It turned out that it wasn't... They weren't the swinging blue jeans of the new wave. It turned out that they were a very, very good band indeed. I'm they very were. proud of it. They were a very, very good band indeed, and still are. <laughs> exactly. This has been brilliant, Bob. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks again, Bob. <laughs> Cheers.